Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Laura Bontempo from the University of Maryland and today we're going to be talking about the management of hypertension, primarily asymptomatic hypertension, how to don't just do something, stand there. I have no disclosures. We're going to be talking about hypertension, what the numbers tell us, how to manage or not manage your asymptomatic hypertension, and then at the end we'll touch a bit on hypertensive emergencies. So here's hypertension in the United States in 2007. The darker colors represent higher incidence of hypertension in the adult population. This is 21 and over. Here's hypertension in the United States in 2017. I will tell you, maybe the maps don't look that different from one another, but the lowest category in that other map isn't even on this map. So the lightest color here represents the mid-range of that other map. The incidence of hypertension has gone up so much in this country that the scale we're using to represent it graphically has even changed. One in three adults have hypertension in the United States. And worldwide, it is estimated that 1.1 billion adults that we know of have elevated blood pressure, and very few of them have it under control. It's out there. Every day you take care of patients with high blood pressure. I guarantee that. Every, every family me medical history has someone with hypertension in it. That's just sort of a given. One in three adults have it. Someone in a family is going to have hypertension. And this is starting to creep into the pediatric population. Now, thankfully, at present, the numbers are still relatively low. It's only estimated that 3.5% of children have primary hypertension, but that's still 3.5%. That number is up from what it used to be. And the range of estimations of pediatric hypertension, it really is pretty, pretty wide. Some studies have estimated that up to 12% of children have hypertension. That seems particularly high. I hope that that is not the accurate number. Right now, it seems to be, most of us agree, about 3.5% of kids have hypertension. That's expected to continue to increase, unfortunately, as the pediatric obesity epidemic in this country increases. So what is it? How high is too high? We get blood pressure readings all the time. What numbers do we have to worry about? Now, this definition ha has varied. It's gone back and forth a few times. And we really, we started out with these different grades of hypertension, then it all got simplified to sort of high, borderline, and normal, and then we're back to this. So, okay, you have gradations of hypertension. Really, if you look, grade three hypertension, greater than 180 over 110, that's pretty high. There are even more subtle definitions about time of day and activity for hypertension. Here's the bottom line to that. If in the United States, a blood pressure greater than 130 over 80 is considered to be hypertension. In Europe, a pressure greater than 140 over 90 is considered to be hypertension. So if your blood pressure is running like 135 over 85 and you live in the United States, you don't want to have hypertension, move to Europe. Simple, you don't have hypertension over there because their numbers are a little bit more generous than ours. That can be confusing, of course. But really, the bottom line is if your blood pressure is greater than 140 over 90 consistently, that's a diagnosis of hypertension. What grade it is doesn't really particularly matter, especially in the emergency department. If your number is elevated, it's elevated, you have hypertension. Now, optimally, here's how a blood pressure should be taken. Your patient's supposed to be sitting in a quiet room for three to five minutes, have an empty bladder, no talking, no smoking, relaxed, calm environment, feet on the floor, back supported by a backrest. That's how you take a blood pressure. If any of you work in an emergency department where this can be done, let me know. I might join you there. This is not how patients get their blood pressure taken in my emergency department, or I doubt in really any emergency department. Someone's walked in from the street into a noisy environment that always has a lot of activity. They're maybe anxious, maybe in pain. Maybe they just had to walk quickly from the garage because it was hot out, whatever it is. But we take our blood pressures, we get our readings, knowing that this is what we're going for, and it is completely unrealistic for our patients in the emergency department. So beyond the environment for taking a blood pressure that we really can't achieve in the emergency department, there are some variables that we can control. There's a manual blood pressure that can be taken and an automatic blood pressure that can be taken. Turns out that interacting with humans drives up your blood pressure. In some small but good quality studies, patients who had their blood pressure taken by another human versus an automatic cuff had a slight change in their blood pressure, usually about 12 points diastolic, uh, excuse me, 12 points systolic and three points diastolic. 
But even having a human come in and trigger that automatic blood pressure cuff makes a difference. When patients had their blood pressure taken by a cuff that was automatically triggered, so no human interaction, the blood pressures could vary from 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury systolic and around 10 millimeters of mercury diastolic. Pretty significant changes. So if you can get a blood pressure on your patient initially that's high, if it can be taken again by an automatic cuff without any human interaction, that might be a more accurate pressure for you. Now, I've been giving this talk at this conference for many years, and, and every year we sort of have the discussion about content and whether or not each lecture should be continued. And the data, a lot of the data about the management of asymptomatic hypertension is not new. It's been around for a while. And I pause every year and wonder, do we still need to teach people about this or do people know about it? And then I had an affirmation that, that, yes, we do need to keep this talk here. As part of my job at the University of Maryland, I work at an access center, which connects our multiple system hospitals. So some of the hospitals with fewer resources can get the resources of our university hospitals, our big tertiary care centers. And I was working at this hospital, and my phone rang, and it was a transfer request for a physician looking for a CCU bed for their patient. They had a 52-year-old female whose chief complaint was high blood pressure. She has a history of hypertension, but she hasn't taken her meds for three years, just simply stopped taking her medications. She had no allergies. She had chest pain five days ago, isolated event, no chest pain since, no chest pain causing her to come to the emergency department, borrowed a friend's blood pressure cuff, found that her blood pressure was very high. Of course, the friend said, you better go to the hospital and get that checked out. So she did. She came to an emergency department. There are her vital signs. You can see she's quite significantly hypertensive. Blood pressure is 233 over 139. That's up there. Her physical exam is unremarkable. So the question is, this patient comes in, really just for the numbers of the blood pressure, and what do you do next? What does this patient need? Does, do they need lab work? Do they need a urinalysis, an EKG, a chest x-ray, a head CT? Perhaps a CTA of their chest. Do they need IV treatment with IV antihypertensives? And or do they need oral treatment, oral antihypertensives? Well, the first thing you're going to do when someone comes into your emergency department with significantly elevated blood pressure is you're just going to wait. You're going to stop. You're going to wait. You're going to leave that patient alone. Therapeutic neglect for 20 to 30 minutes. And then you're going to recheck that blood pressure, do nothing. It works a lot of the time. In almost a third of patients who came in with significantly elevated blood pressure, above 160 over 100, when you leave them alone and just recheck that blood pressure, again with that automated cuff, those patients will have their blood pressure decrease below that 160 over 100 millimeter of mercury range. So first step, leave them be. Now this patient has a known history of hypertension and she hasn't taken her meds for three years. So you can try this, of course, but with that known history of hypertension, didn't, probably wasn't gonna work and didn't work for this patient. So now the question is, what's the patient's diagnosis? Her diagnosis is asymptomatic, markedly elevated blood pressure. And this is generally defined as a blood pressure greater than 160 over 100. Some people use 180 over 110, but we can be a little bit more conservative, 160 over 100. And this is defined by the Joint Commission. Now, asymptomatic, markedly elevated blood pressure is a little bit of a mouthful. Memorable, but a little bit of a mouthful. I personally would have preferred if it was termed markedly elevated asymptomatic hypertension, because then I could just call it meh. Meh would be much easier, because that's really how I feel about it. What her diagnosis is not is hypertensive urgency. Please get rid of this term from your lexicon. We've been working to eliminate this term for years. It is a gray, murky water kind of diagnosis that really should not be used. And this is 2018 practice guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology and the European Society of Hypertension. This is their guidelines for the management of hypertension. If you do your find function for this document and look for hypertensive urgency, phrase not found. It's not in there. We are trying to get rid of this term. Why are we trying to get rid of this term? Well, as far back as 2004, so not cutting edge here, 2004, 
This came out from the Committee on Prevention, Detection, Evaluation, and Treatment of High Blood Pressure. The term urgency has led to overly aggressive management of many patients with severe uncomplicated hypertension, Aggressive dosing with IV drugs or oral agents and rapidly lowering the blood pressure is not without risk. In 2017, the American Cardio College of Cardiology and Friends, you can see all the acronyms up there, they do use the term hypertensive urgency. So it still is in that document. It talks about severe blood pressure elevation in an otherwise stable patient. However, if you read deeper into the document, here's the important part. Within that same document, it says that this, there's, with hypertensive urgency, there's no indication for referral to the emergency department, there's no indication for immediate reduction of that blood pressure, and there's no indication for hospitalization. So yes, they kept the term, then they tell you not to do anything about it. What this patient has is asymptomatic, markedly elevated blood pressure. And that is a term that should be used for patients without evidence of end organ damage who have high blood pressure readings. Now, why does it matter? It matters because there's no benefit to aggressive treatment and there is potential for harm. First, let's talk about the lack of benefit. There are multiple studies. This one back to 2016 looked at patients with really pretty elevated systolic pressures, pressures greater than 220 millimeters of mercury. And they looked at patients who were admitted to the hospital, had inpatient management, and patients that were sent home and had outpatient management. No difference in major adverse cardiac events at six months time. Treatment, more re another study more recently, 2020, looking at patients again with really high blood pressure numbers. They followed patients with treatment for MACE and other outcomes and their conclusion for the list of things they were looking for, there was no difference in outcomes of interest. You are not benefiting patients by sending them to the emergency department or by hospitalizing them if their numbers are high but their symptoms are absent. Of course, do no harm. Your patient came in with hypertension. You don't want to precipitate cardiac ischemia and you don't want to precipitate a stroke. Well, isn't that why patients come in the first place? They're afraid they're gonna have a stroke from their high blood pressure? Well, over the long term, yes, of course, hypertension is a risk factor for having a stroke. But over the short term, you lower that blood pressure too fast, you're putting your patient at risk for having a stroke from that precipitous relative hypotension, which we'll talk a bit more about. In 2010, a study came out, looked at over 2,000 patients, and significant numbers of them had PRN IV blood pressure medications. These were all inpatients, written as part of their orders. No consideration whatsoever for the patient's symptoms. Just PRN orders for IV blood pressure lowering medications. 60% of those hospitalized patients received IV medications for lowering blood pressure with no regard to their clinical situation. 10 years later, study came out. Again, elevated blood pressures, no evidence of end organ dysfunction. 80% of patients, 80 plus percent of patients, IV antihypertensives, and here's the thing. A third of those patients were bradycardic, and 4% of those patients became hypotensive. 4% of patients that were stable without symptoms became hypotensive because of interventions of IV blood pressure medications. These are serious risks to the patient when blood pressure is lowered too rapidly. So ASEP, ASEP came out in 2013, looking at all this data and other studies as well, and came out with this clinical policy. And they really addressed two questions. The first question is, in the emergency department, if your patient comes in with asymptomatic elevated blood pressure, does screening for target or organ injury reduce rates of adverse outcomes? What do you need to do for these patients when they come in? They have markedly elevated asymptomatic hypertension. Do you need to get an EKG, chest x-ray, UA, labs? What do we need to do? What does the evidence tell us? Well, that EKG, it doesn't change anything in the patient's outcome. Yes, you'll probably identify LVH. Okay, your patient has LVH with hypertension. No great surprise there. Chest x-ray, maybe your patient has some cardiomegaly. Not going to change your management. Your analysis, you're looking for protein, of course, right? Well, if your patient has protein in the urine, probably not going to change anything you do for that patient in the short term. Creatinine, well, 
we know kidney disease can be asymptomatic, and there is actually a potential benefit. If you diagnose AKI in a patient who's otherwise symptomatic, that may change their disposition. They may come in, they may get a further workup for their kidney injury and management of that. So creatinine is something to consider. The rest of it, not going to benefit your patient in the emergency department. These things do not need to be done, although often they are done. Suggested benefit of checking your creatinine. It's at the discretion of the treating clinician. Question number two from ASEP. In patients with asymptomatic markedly elevated blood pressure, does ED medical intervention reduce rates of adverse outcomes? If you lower the blood pressure in the emergency department, does that help your patient do better for the long term? And the short answer to that is no, but with complex questions, generally a yes or a no is not the end of the discussion. So there's always a but in there. Patients need follow-up. You can't just say, yes, I found your blood pressure, it's high, good luck with that. It is your obligation to make sure that patient has follow-up arranged. And really, the patient, this is a, a statement for, for follow-up about patients having your follow-up arranged for, through the emergency department. Now, it does not need to be tomorrow. It does not even need to be within a week because that can be very challenging for patients, especially in my practice environment. Follow-up within one month is really what is recommended for these patients to avoid any longer-term adverse outcomes for these patients. Generally, I can get someone into a clinic somewhere within a month. You do not need to and likely should not rapidly lower that blood pressure in the emergency department. You certainly do not need to admit that patient, but please make sure that patient has follow-up. So how do we do with this? The answer is okay. We do okay. The one study, the first one by Axon, looked at, they surveyed actually 180 residents, family medicine, internal medicine, and surgery residents, and they asked if you were called with an elevated blood pressure reading in a patient that had no symptoms, would you give an antihypertensive, an IV antihypertensive or an oral hypertensive, and 44% of residents said that they would. So I'm an optimist. 56% of residents said that they wouldn't. That's progress. We're making some progress on this. Uh, second study, there were about 90 patients with incidental hypertension seen in the emergency department. Those patients had follow-up arranged for whatever else they were there for. Only a handful had written discharge instructions telling them they had hypertension, but on an exit survey, nearly two-thirds of patients said they remember being told that they had hypertension and that they needed to follow up. So the numbers are okay, certainly could be better, but we are trying to do the right thing for the patients here. So let's get back to our patient, the patient I got the call about who is in need of a CCU bed, remember. What did she have done? She had all these things done. She had the works. She had a basic metabolic panel, a urine, an EKG, a chest x-ray. She got her head scanned. She got her chest scanned. She got IV antihypertensives. And there's her diagnosis, hypertensive urgency. And just in case you think I'm not telling you, you the truth about this mega workup that was done for this asymptomatic patient, there are the screenshots of her orders. Final results on all of those things. This was all done for this patient, plus a few others. Her ED course, the patient was given labetalol, 10 milligrams IV. She was started on an icardipine drip. When that didn't work fast enough, she was given another 10 milligrams of labetalol. And the call to me was for an ICU bed because she was on an icardipine drip. That can't go to the floor, certainly can't go home, and it can't even go to the floor. This patient needs an ICU. Well, these medications worked. They did. There are her vital signs. You can see the patient came in quite hypertensive, 260s over 140s, and you can watch her blood pressure as she got these medications. And by 3.30 in the afternoon, my goodness, look how much progress they'd made. Her blood pressure is 158 over 92. Great. That's her vital sign at 3.30. Here's nursing documentation at 3.44. Patient feels woozy. They checked her blood sugar. It was within normal range. Well, the patient doesn't feel woozy because she's hypoglycemic. The patient feels woozy because she doesn't have enough millimeters of mercury perfusing her brain. They precipitously dropped her blood pressure out of this extremely elevated range to what is approaching normal. But that's not normal for this patient. And a patient who is asymptomatic now is symptomatic. Why did that happen? Well, 
you have pretty steady end organ perfusion over a pretty wide range of mean arterial pressures. That's in a patient without hypertension. A patient with, with hypertension has the same thing. They have pretty steady end organ perfusion over a wide range of mean arterial pressures, but that whole thing is shifted higher. Their end organs will be perfused at a different range of mean arterial pressures. And if you look on the x-axis, if you drop that mean arterial pressure to what's within normal for a patient without hypertension, look where you are on that curve of someone who has hypertension. That end organ perfusion is dropping. This woman's brain is feeling woozy because it's not getting the perfusion that it's used to getting and probably has been getting for three years when she stopped taking her medications. So here I am on the line, this gentleman requesting an ICU bed for the patient. And I'm here just connecting doctors and I have to do my due diligence. I get a cardiologist on the line. We talk together to this provider and we say, just please stop, stop the IV medications. Give her her home medication orally that she should have been on for the past three years but hasn't been taking. Stop all this IV craziness. Give her her oral medication and then if it gets better and her wooziness goes away and she feels okay, maybe not an ICU, maybe home. We couldn't quite convince a doctor to send her home, but we did get the patient to the floor, not on a drip. What did this patient really need when she came in? Here is the list of options, right? Consider that basic metabolic panel because you can consider checking a creatinine on that patient. Give her her oral hypertensive. She was asymptomatic. Do no harm. Don't drop that blood pressure unnecessarily. And really, what she needs, probably more than all of this, is a doctor's appointment. She needs outpatient management for gradual lowering of her blood pressure. Now, it is completely fine to start an oral agent in the emergency department if you want to. Go ahead, do that. Start the patient, let them start on that. By the time they get to their doctor, they've probably had a few days of that medication. You can see how it's working. Completely fine. But please, treat the patient, not the number. I've given this talk before, as I mentioned, and I often hear from audience members that they would love to do this, but their hospital would not allow patients to be admitted to the floor with numbers, blood pressure numbers, above a certain cutoff. And I understand that that is a big barrier for a lot of practicing emergency physicians. I can't change hospital policies myself, but I have to say you have to advocate for your patients. There's risk to lowering blood pressure too quickly. And certainly there's risk to putting someone in the ICU that doesn't need to be there. And there's risk to the next patient who probably, who maybe really does need an ICU and there's not a bed available. So advocate on your patient's behalf, maybe not when you're directly at the bedside, but talk to administration. At the University of Maryland, we have come up with very clear guidelines that multiple services have agreed upon, and we can admit patients to the floor with markedly elevated hypertension as long as they are asymptomatic. Not that we're admitting them for that diagnosis, but if they come in with something else and they have that diagnosis, the patient can go to the floor. We don't need to lower blood pressures just to make numbers look better. So that's asymptomatic hypertension. For just a moment, we're going to flip over and talk about hypertensive emergencies. This is the minority of what you're going to take care of. Happens to about 1% of patients with hypertension. Now, in the emergency department, we're gonna see it because those are the patients that are gonna come in to see us. But overall, the incidence is low. The hypertensive emergencies we're worried about are anything that's hypertension that's affecting end organ perfusion. Right, what do we mostly worry about? We worry about hearts, brains, ischemia. As I said, the incidence is very low. It's acutely progressive target organ dysfunction. So if someone has CKD and you check a creatinine and the creatinine continues to be elevated, that's not acute progressive target organ dysfunction. That is not a hypertensive emergency. We worry about the heart with ischemia. We worry about the brain with strokes. We worry about the kidney with kidney disease. And in a pregnant woman, we of course worry about the uterus as well. Those are the main target organs that we are worried about. Our goal here is not gradual lowering of the blood pressure. Here, you're in an emergency situation. It is a hypertensive emergency. Within the first hour of identifying a hypertensive emergency, you want to lower that blood pressure by about 25%, the MAP, the mean arterial pressure. Two times the diastolic plus the systolic divided by three. Lower that by 25%.
you need to do some numbers there. Within the first hour, that's your goal. And then beyond that first hour, the additional six hours, you want to reduce that blood pressure to less than 160 over 100 and to the goal of the hypertensive emergency that you're caring for, be it an intracranial hemorrhage, ischemia, whatever it is. But you want to bring those numbers down under 160 over 110 within six hours. So 25% reduction, 25 to 30% reduction, a little bit of wiggle room in there in the first hour, and then bringing it farther down six hours thereafter. And then progressively, over the next two days of that patient's stay, bring them back down to more of a normal range. Again, slowly bring that mean arterial pressure down to maintain, uh, maintain end organ perfusion. Now, that requires some math, right? These numbers are high. Patient presents, let's say this is a blood pressure, 233 over 139 millimeters of mercury, that's high. And your patient has something going on that tells you this is a hypertensive emergency. Some end organ is not being adequately perfused. If you calculate the map, that map is super high. It's 170.3 millimeters of mercury. 25% reduction in that map still leaves you at a map of 128 millimeters of mercury. This means just for example, your goal within the first hour could be to get your patient to a blood pressure of 184 over 100. That still feels too high, right? So take the time to do the math. Oftentimes the map is calculated by your telemetry monitors. Now, what we use as a calculation of the map is actually a rough estimate. What the, what the telemetry monitors use is actually more accurate. So you can pick the map off of your screen, multiply that by 0.75, hence a 25% reduction, and realize that that is the map that you're going for, because the numbers will still feel very high. You don't want to overshoot. You do want to be cautious here. There was a study, again, several years old, 2007, and about 57% of patients in this situation were excessively treated. They, they overshot, and 4% had major ischemic events. So use titratable drugs, do the math, realize what your goals are. You don't want to take one end organ problem and turn it into another end organ problem where your patient is now having an ischemic event. Again, I know we're not in person here, so you can't ask me questions, but I will, my e uh, email address will follow and I will gladly accept uh, any questions that you have and get back to you. Here's something to think about. The greatest danger to a man with high blood pressure lies in its discovery because then some fool is certain to try and reduce it. Why did I put this quote up here? Because this is not new. This was written in 1931. We come up, came up with this idea, and we're still chasing down people over-treating blood pressures today in 2022. So the bottom line is asymptomatic, markedly elevated blood pressure, please do no harm. Consider starting an oral agent in the emergency department, the oral agent of your choice. No need for IV medications. Arrange for follow-up. There's no need to do a mega emergency department workup. Check a creatinine if you wish. If your patient is having a hypertensive emergency, it is a whole different ballgame. This is not asymptomatic. It's not just a number. It's evidence of end organ perfusion. D a, a, a difficulty with, with a problem with end organ perfusion. This IV treatment is what is necessary for that patient, and you want to do your math. You want to lower your MAP by 25% within that first hour. Protect that end organ, but don't overshoot. Be careful. Use titratable agents. I hope this has helped you in the management of your patients. Again, there is my email address and my Twitter handle. If you have any questions, concerns, please, by all means, contact me. I often get asked for references for this talk because people like to use these references in their discussion with administrators in their hospital to realize that there is potential for harm for patients and what needs to be done and what does not need to be done. I will gladly provide those for you. I hope this has helped and thank you very much for spending your time with me today.